Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Weathers, and I'm the Assistant Director in the LGBT Center on the Health Science Campus. My pronouns are he, his, him, and they, them. And I'm really glad that you all are able to make it to today, our fourth session within the 2020-2021 LGBTQ Plus Affirming Healthcare Series. Today's topic is about the best practices um, for health providers to navigate and manage the provider parent guardian relationship as the provider offers care for an LGBTQ plus youth in a clinical setting. We decided to focus on this particular topic because we received tons of questions around this exact scenario. Unfortunately, due to the limited amount of time that we have today, this conversation will not be exhaustive and will only focus on the clinical visit. Today's session will be recorded and closed captioned as well as uploaded to our YouTube channel. Before we get into this session into our panel of experts, I would like to just mention to everybody that please register for the patient simulation session on Thursday. It's gonna be on Thursday, March 18th, 2021 from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. The registration link is right there, the bit.ly, or new this year as well, we have the virtual patient simulation session. All you have to do is complete the three virtual patient simulations. There's a patient simulation for a patient named Sarah, a patient named Raven, and a patient named William. And then you, they're all located on our website at louisville.edu slash LGBT. And then go to the Affirming Healthcare Series page and you'll see it right there at the bottom. Now I'm very excited to be able to introduce our esteemed panel of experts today. First is Dr. Faye Jones. Her pronouns are she, her, and hers. Dr. Jones currently serves as the Associate Vice President for Health Affairs, Diversity of Initiatives at the UofL HSC. She is also the Vice Chair for Inclusive Excellence in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. And last but certainly not least, she is the Interim Senior Vice President for Diversity and Equity at the University of Louisville. Everybody give a round of applause for Dr. Faye Jones. Next, we have Carter Hatchett, pronouns he, him, or they, them. And Carter previously served as the Diversity and Equity Coordinator for the Louisville Youth Group. Everybody give it up for Carter Hatchett. Next, we have Colton Grow, pronouns he, his, him. Colton is currently the Community Education and Outreach Coordinator for Louisville Youth Group. Give it up for Colton, everyone. And then last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Suzanne Kingery. Her pronouns are she, her, hers. And she is the Director of the Pediatric and Adolescent Gender Education Program at Norton's Children's Endocrinology. And she is also the Professor of Pediatrics in the school, University of Louisville School of Medicine. Now, the Pediatric Adolescent Gender Education Program, also known as the PAGE Clinic or the Gender Clinic at Norton's Children's Endocrinology, was created in 2015, and it became Louisville, Louisville's and Kentucky's first clinic to provide medical and mental health support to serve youth whose gender identity differs from their sex assigned at birth, including but not limited to transgender, gender diverse, gender creative, gender non-congruent, and gender non-binary youth. Now, Dr. Kingery is gonna start our session off today by talking about some of the practices that they implement within their clinic to uh, make sure that it is affirming for LGBTQ youth as well as their parents. Everybody, I hope you enjoy. Pronoun of the patient, we still ask, um, understanding that those things can change over time. Um, names can change, uh, uh, correct pronouns can change, and so asking that um, is, okay, is okay, and we want to demonstrate that and, and show that to parents. Um, and I say the same thing to parents, too, you know, when I introduce myself um, to the family and um, ask our patient, also ask the parent um, their um, name and their pronouns as well. Sometimes they're taken back a little bit by that um, and they don't really know what to do and then I oftentimes will get, well that's the first time anyone's ever asked me that and you know um, that's sad that that's the first time somebody's ever asked them that but it also demonstrates and normalizes that this is actually the right thing to do. Um, we should be doing it every time um, and um, 
you know, that, that, you know, tried to normalize this, this kind of question asking. And so that's sort of how our, our clinic is set up. Um, when patients come in, you know, it's, it's really important that every person in the, the step and in the process is um, affirming and they use the correct names and pronouns, whether it's, you know, the front office staff to our MAs, to our nurses, to our providers, everyone is just as important um, in this process. Um, you know, if a patient has a great experience with the provider, that's great, but it's not okay if they don't have a great experience when they walk in the door. Um, and so we, we wanna make sure that that experience is um, is good so that they come back um, to us um, and that we can um, meet their healthcare needs, um, whatever that might be. So, um, with that, I will kind of step aside and um, and let others uh, talk and or ask questions. I know I've said a lot. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, I, that's that's amazing what you all do there, and I think that um, it's super duper important that you um, you all are um, inclusive and affirming from, like I always like to say, from parking lot to billing. It's the entire process. It's super, super important that you all are hitting and checking off the boxes everywhere you all to go. And especially, I didn't know you all called them before and to check in with about uh, names as well as pronouns, which is super duper like above and beyond. I think that everybody should be uh, doing these type of things. Um, now, I know that, uh, especially you said on the intake forms and EHRs, um, you all like to make sure that you're inclusive of gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, I actually want to pivot this question to Carter and ask, um, what are some things that you uh, necessarily would look for on like an intake form that would help you um, feel necessarily safe or like have a space for like LGBTQ youth um, to like just uh, to, to feel like comfortable and dis uh, disclosing their sexual identity, their gender identity, what are things that uh, youth would look for in those forms? Definitely. Um, I, I would, uh, I, I also thank you, Dr. Kingery, for uh, really highlighting the resources that you all provide. Um, I know personally, I have been going to Dr. Folsom for a couple of years now. So um, I for sure know that, you know, your all's clinic and what you all provide um, is, is really pivotal, especially being um, a trans person um, and being able to feel comfortable. Um, I will say that I think it's really important that you all do call prior to to sort of know name and pronouns, but maybe even in that process asking sort of um, I, maybe I, I don't know if you're directly talking to the patient also, but if they're comfortable with um, their family being in the room in that situation of talking about gender and sexuality, um, because I know um, in different uh, minority groups that, you know, those topics are really touchy can be, you know, sort of very loaded. Um, and so even when thinking about offering up an intake form, sort of being aware of who they're in company with um, and whether it's, you know, do you need to take this intake form alone or, you know, with a, with a provider or with a parent um, and sort of just realizing that um, a safe space for them to enclose that sort of information may be different than sort of what you perceive to be safe. Um, and so even, you know, taking the step to sort of um, ask or make available, you know, whether it be a parent step out or if a parent is necessary to stay in the room and sort of think around those things. Um, but as far as the form itself goes, um, I have found that while I know offering options can, can be good um, and also easier to like catalog things, um, that giving the youth that I worked with personally the option to name things for themselves is huge. And they typically may have terms or things that I'm not even aware of. So it, it can be um, a really good space for um, the clinic, clinic to also um, become more knowledgeable, um, depending on how that youth does self-identify, whether it be uh, their gender identity or their sexual identity. Um, so just being aware of, of those things and sort of making a safe space, realizing that there's a lot of language that is developing constantly that may not uh, fit within, like you talked about, the, the heteronormative structure of things that are, that are done typically in healthcare, um, and sort of giving the youth that freedom to name those identities for themselves, sort of describe the, the feelings and relationships that they're having, and, and sort of going from there. Yes, thank you, Carter. I think that, that that's a really... Um super important for providers. It's just making sure that they, that the provider creates that space for the uh, the youth to be able to name the identities. I like how you said that. Um, this question, I'm, I'm gonna pivot towards Faye actually. Um, as a provider, what are ways that you um, invite youth to share, or as Carter said, name those identities uh, during the visit where they feel safe and comfortable? Oh, 
you're, you're muted. So we try to start those discussions really early with our, with our kids, with our youth. So, you know, even at the, you know, to whatever, whenever they are talking, uh, we ask them to name different parts, what they call it, because, you know, people do, like you said, have different names for different things and for who they are. So we try to engage them in that conversation as early as possible. Um, and, you know, at the younger ages, when parents are there with the child, uh, we kind of prepare these parents, too, to let them know as the children get older and, and reach a, an age where we can talk to them by themselves. We, we prepare them to let them know that we will be asking them to leave the room. So, and that may be at different stages depending on the child, but uh, we try to make sure we have that safe space that our adolescents, our youth and adolescents can have that privacy with the physician. And the majority of the time, parents or guardians, whoever that might be, will, um, will be okay with that. Uh, there's times when it's not, but we have techniques of how to, um, get the information in a safe way from, from, from the child or adolescent. Um, we do intake forms too. We do have surveys and things for them to fill out and that they fill out themselves. And we look at those. Um, and there's information on there that you know, may be private. And we let the uh, guardians know, the caretakers know, this is something I want this person to fill out. And we will be discussing it with them. So it's not for to give it to the guardian and let them do it, but it's for our patients to do. When we have those times when um, the guardian really doesn't want to excuse themselves for the room, you know, a lot of times our, our uh, young adults have to have immunizations or have to have blood draws. So we go with them and get that privacy time so that they can talk. And if it's not, if, it's, if it doesn't happen on this visit, we plan on seeing them again. So we just kind of keep on building that trust and, and give them the, the opportunity, but we also give them the opportunity that they can contact us outside of that appointment and give us information that they may want. Now this time, Aaron, I can say you're muted. <laughs> okay, am I muted you all? Can y'all hear me now? We can hear you now. I feel like we've probably all been there during like this pandemic with all these Zoom meetings and everything, just being not being and being muted. But uh, I think that that was super duper important to bring up just um, the fact of creating that space where the youth knows that it's centered around them and they they are the they are important. They are the ones who are important. It's not about their parents. It's not about the provider, but it's about the youth that is in that room. Um, Colton, I actually want to ask you this next question um, from a mental health perspective. What are some additional ways that you would um, suggest or uh, provide for a provider to invite a youth to kind of like share those identities and even really feel comfortable in sharing those identities or their identity. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. So I'm, um, just so all the participants know, I'm, uh, um, I have a master's degree in clinical psychology and I'm currently um, a therapist at Meridian Behavioral Health under the supervision of Dr. Warren Lambert. Um, and then I'm also in Spalding University's clinical psychology doctoral program. Um, and so I'm in the process of that too. I only have a couple more years left, thankfully. I'm excited to be done soon. Um, but when I work with 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 youth, with young adults, um, um, that is um, the fun thing about youth and young adults is that you're not just working with them, you're working with the family as well most of the time. Um, and so I usually will have conversations with the with my my clients of um, I won't tell your parents anything. Everything that you talk to me about is confidential um, unless it's something that I believe, like unless you are in danger of harming yourself or harming somebody else. Um, and I tell parents the exact same thing that uh, whether they like it or not, I'm not going to, to share things with them about what I talk about with um, my clients in therapy um, because that does disrupt our therapeutic relationship and can cause um, therapeutic ruptures and barriers to treatment. And so it's getting that sense of trust from the beginning of, I'm not going to tell your parents all of your information. So it invites them to just kind of tell me whatever they want, whenever they're ready to. Um, yeah. 
Thank you, thank you. Just kind of like letting folks, letting the uh, patient know that, you know, whatever you say uh, is between you and I, and even even uh, disclosing that. Now, there are certain things that if you do mention saying that I will have to report and just kind of being very uh, straight up about that uh, with them is, I think, a very reaffirming to um, them to have, a, this is a space for them to disclose their identity. Now, Faye, I have a, a follow-up question kind of to this uh, question about uh, sharing identities. Um, we, under we understand that patients, when they come into the rooms, they hold multiple um, identities. So they could be even uh, intersecting, mar uh, mar intersecting marginalized identities. Are there any special uh, considerations that uh, a provider should think about when working with uh, BIPOC, uh, Bi uh, BIPOC LGBTQ youth? And for those that um, aren't familiar with that for, uh, acronym, it's uh, Black, Indigenous, People of Color, uh, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer, Plus Youth. Okay. Um, you know, being part of the BIPOC community period has its own special stresses. And, um, the cultural issues related to uh, persons of color uh, in in this situation can be uh, doubly or triply traumatic. Um, so you, you bring those things out. You talk about it. You talk about how is this in your community, in your family? What are the thoughts? How are you uh, dealing with this? What kind of support can we give you? And if there's uh, particularly support programs that we can refer to so they don't feel like they're alone because that is that is a big deal you feel like you're alone when these things are going on so you want to see people that's like you that looks like you that feels like you that's going through some of these experiences to talk to so we make sure you have those resources available uh, to discuss it as well and the other things tell them this is okay you're okay that is really important because sometimes people feel like they're not, but this is normal. Yes, thank you just uh, for kind of reifying that. Um, I think that, that would have been nice for me to hear it when I was a youth uh, coming up. Uh, definitely just uh, you're not alone, you're, uh, you're enough that you're, you're, this is normal. Um, Carter, I would like to just see if uh, you want to touch on that a little bit, if uh, there's anything, additional ways that you think providers can really um, hold that space for BIPOC, queer and trans youth uh, to share their identities in the clinical setting. Um, I think Faye really touched on it in the sense of just calling it out. Um, I think a lot of times people, um, especially if you are not BIPOC, may feel uncomfortable in talking around, like, you know, just being Black and there's a cultural um, significance to that and being queer. Um, but I think opening that space, sort of allowing them to, to, to talk about it. And I think, again, sort of being aware that family and parents play a huge role in that. And so maybe having that conversation um, in a more personal setting will will then obviously bring out a bit more of that. Um, but I think from, from the research that I had done as well, just the simple fact that you cared enough to mention these things, that you thought deep enough to know that there is a cultural difference. There are, um, there are just, you know, changes for you being a BIPOC person that that uh, making that connection to that youth will make that that much of a difference um, it, and then it will you know make them more likely to be more vulnerable in those scenarios um, because a lot of times youth can be faced with um, a lot of negative um, attitude or sort of treatment from professionals um, especially you know just being a black person in the health in healthcare industry in general you know black people are tend to be overlooked or ignored or silenced for sort of the issues that they're going through and so I think literally just giving that youth a voice and letting them know that you know what they're dealing with you know big small um, is important is significant um, and also that there is space. I think what I've noticed that, you know, you can give information to parents, you can give information to family and things like that, but what is really strong and, and can be a big game changer for youth is having other youth that look like them and that they can really relate to. Um, and so even having, um, you know, resources within the clinic that, you know, point them in direction of other youth groups in town or online platforms that they can access, um, or even more information for them to give to their family, I think is also really pivotal um, as far as just providing space, sort of being aware that, you know, 
you have to be all encompassing in that form. And that, you know, while you may provide this space while you're here in the clinic, that when they go home, that, you know, that's not the space that they're no longer in. So sort of thinking of how you can extend that to when they are no longer in your own space. And yes. before you go oh, on, sorry. I just want to say one more thing. That. And thank you, Carter, for, for that information too, for your insight. A lot of times kids, no matter, you know, how they identify themselves. There's a lot of times they're scared to tell family, to tell the fam other parents. You know, we can be that safe place, at least there, and make sure that they have a safe place afterwards too. Mm -hmm. that, that, that actually pivots me right to my next, uh, transitions me to my next question that I was actually gonna ask uh, you, uh, Faye, or you, Dr. Kingery. Um, how do you all, cause it's, it's, there is that dynamic that's happening in the, in the room with, um, the youth um, that may they may want to disclose the, uh, their information with you as a provider, but then there's their parent, and then there's that's that dynamic that they're relying on them. How do you all give uh, young people the opportunity to speak along with you um, as a provider? And I know you are you kind of touched on this uh, some of the strategies you all use uh, with um, like drawing blood or different uh, uh, tests like that. But um, uh, as as a provider, um, so how do you all give young people that opportunity to speak along with you? Uh, while also respecting a young person's comfort level, in addition to being mindful of that power dynamic with the family member or guardian. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask that question, then I have a follow-up question to this as well for uh, Dr. King Green Fay. I, I, I can start, Dr. Jones, but, um, you know, um, in, um, in our um, clinic, we are somewhat lucky in the sense that the patients who typically come typically have supportive families, which is why they're there. Um, and unfortunately, we don't get to, to see and treat um, patients who don't really have supportive families. Um, and those are the obviously the patients that I worry most about um, because they certainly are most at risk. Um, having said that, you know, in our clinic, you know, I normalize everything and I say, you know, I like to give all my patients the opportunity um, to speak um, privately with me. Um, and so I'll ask um, whomever is with them um, to, you know, if do you mind stepping out of the room, I'll come get you um, um, when, you know, we are finished. Um, I typically don't have a lot of pushback from um, family members when I, um, when I normalize it and say, I ask, you know, all my patients um, the same, or I'd like to have an opportunity to talk with them um, so that they can discuss anything with me in private. Most of the people don't have a, a, a problem with that. You know, many times the patients don't have anything to say to me. They're like, well, I don't have anything I need to tell you. I've already told you everything I needed to say. And, and that's okay too. Um, but they also know that um, if there is something they need to talk about, maybe not this time, but next time, like Dr. Jones said, you know, next time that they know, okay, there is actually something I probably wanted to talk um, with them about. And so, um, and so, you know, I know that it's okay and I can and to, to do that. Very rarely do I have um, someone disclose something to me um, in private, um, but I always want that opportunity and for them to feel um, secure and safe um, in doing so. And, and sort of going back to, you know, what Colton was saying, um, you know, that um, we, we're going to keep information private. Um, and we tell them, you know, there's only certain things that we, we need to tell their parents about. And it's certainly if that affects their own safety or the safety of others. No, Dr. Jones. So we have a variety of levels of parent engagement. Uh, so, um, you know, the best is, you know, if they are very open, you know, if they can be very open with whoever their guardian is, uh, and that's a loving relationship, and it's no doubt, and most of the time, no matter how uh, volatile that situation is, most of the time, the guardian is, it's, it's out of love in some way, but they handle it in a way that's not constructive for the health, uh, health, physical and mental health of the young adult here. So we have to make sure, and like I said, we try to make sure it's in a safe environment, just like uh, Dr. Kingry said, uh, and give them that opportunity to have that space and that confidentiality. Uh, there are times when, when a young adult comes in and um, the guardian is with them, and that is that is the conversation. Uh, that's why the guardian has brought them in because they feel like, okay, you got to do something. So we try to give those guardians the language 
that is going to be more healthy uh, for for this uh, person, and hopefully help help the young adult with strategies and resources to help deal with this too, because it can be very traumatic um, within their office and at home. So trying to help the help the guardians understand. You, how you react and how you uh, your behavior will affect the long time uh, long term health of your child. So we try to go for where wherever they are in that process and try to guide them along that path. Thank you, thank you, um, just for that because it it did it that it, it really kind of struck me a deep and just uh, the the way that a parent or guardian is interacting with that, that, that child, that young adult, um, it has a long la lifetime impact uh, that, uh, uh, that, you know, in long to adulthood that they might still be unpacking. Um, especially when they say very uh, anti-LGBTQ uh, sentiments or in, even if it's like um, those underhanded comments or anything like that, that they, they might not even think too much about. Um, my uh, next question for uh, Colton and, and Carter is kind of around this uh, issue. Um, how can uh, providers really help like address um, when a parent or guardian or family member uh, expresses some type of anti-LGBTQ plus sentiment? It can be from very explicit hate speech or to even like the, the, the implicit bias or like I like to call like the little shady underhanded comments that uh, a, a family member or guardian might say like, you, you know, there's a, there's a plethora of those. Yeah, definitely. Now I work, I see a lot of um, this happening with my clients. So a lot of the times mental health uh, providers are often the step like between um, youth going to see a medical provider. So a lot of the, so I've seen um, youth whose parents are very supportive and they just like parents just don't know, they don't have the language to put to things. And I've seen youth where parents bring them to me and they go, I need you to fix my kid because I don't know what's wrong with them. Um, and it's um, kind of fielding that in between of what do these parents know? What do they not know? What are they saying? What are they doing that's contributing to the difficulties that the kiddo may be having? Um, and so I always, when I meet with, um, with parents, I always talk with parents on their own too. Um, being a mental health provider, I do get the privilege of being able to see my clients for longer periods of time. Um, like medical providers, they are, you all are such busy people that you don't have a lot of time to sit in a room with, you, you know, your, your patients. And so um, my, what I see my role is in this is that I provide a lot of psychoeducation to parents. I talk to them about what gender is, what sexual orientation is, um, how that is a socially constructed thing that we put out into the world um, and that their, their youth, um, their, their kids, their young adults, whoever they may be, have been, have known about their identity for a really long time. Um, kids start processing gender at the age of three and figuring out what gender is um, and research trends right now. So about 10 to 15 years ago, youth were coming out um, between ages like 16 and 18. And now um, in the last five years, it's between the ages of nine and 12. So it's a huge shift developmentally in where youth are figuring out who they are. And so a lot of parents just don't know. They've been raised in a society that is heteronormative, that is heterosexist, that says that being somebody who is straight and cisgender is the norm and that's what people should be. And so sometimes they don't know that um, the things that they say or the things that they've heard, the things that they've been raised around are harmful to their youth. Um, sometimes they do know that they're harmful when it's really explicit, when it's really damaging. Sometimes they do know, and, and that's their own way of attempting to fix what they see as a problem. And so my role as a mental health provider, as a therapist is, to support you know, my client first, support the youth, the young adult who's coming to see me and begin to hopefully shift that family space to where it can be even just a little more supportive. It doesn't have to be perfect, but maybe just a little. Definitely, thank you, thank you so much for that, Colton. Just uh, 
just knowing that for the providers to um, have that kind of like little bit of support, uh, even if it's just a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Just knowing that somebody out there cares and it's, 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 a, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a light uh, in a way, beacon. Um, yeah. Car uh, Carter, I want to ask you all to uh, ask you as well to, if you want to speak on that or even uh, just this follow-up question of, you mentioned about, you know, the youth has to go, might have to go home to that anti um, LGBTQ environment too. So like they, they might say some things in the, in the clinical setting, but what are ways that a provider can help support a youth that they suspect may be actually living in that type of environment where they have to go home to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> from, from what I can tell, I, I honestly think that providing the youth and um, as well as the parents with um, resources, whether it be, you know, literal reading uh, material. Um, but I have found that even for the parents having a, a group for them to talk to other parents that are going through this, um, that have LGBTQ youth or have, their, have the LGBTQ kids, um, to be able to have that very, sometimes very blatant conversations or sometimes very explicit conversations with each other um, and, and, and hopefully someone who is in that group that is supportive so that they can sort of, you know, frame, the, frame those mind frames or mindsets. Um, but just being able to, I feel like a lot of times parents are frustrated, angry, take things personally, um, and don't really see it from, you know, their child just trying to express themselves um, in the way that they do. And so even, like I said, giving the parents that space to sort of deal with their own emotions um, around the subject um, and sort of detach from that and realize that that's it's no fault of their own it's nothing that you know I can't punish it out of you or anything like that but just recognizing uh recognizing that you know that that is your child that you have also been sort of raised in a very heteronormative mind frame as you know as society has um but just giving them th those resources that reading material the groups um online in person um has from what I've seen has really made a difference um and even from what Colton said of having youth come out so young now um I know can be very jarring for parents also in the sense of like you know a level of sexualization with children which is typically already done in heteronormative um, society a lot of times but is typically passed off and so I think if anything really sort of highlighting um how you know things that are already set in place can be harmful to the youth and to the parent whether they realize it or not in that relationship um, and maybe giving them you know alternatives of ways that they're doing things now um, also offering the parents a level of therapy because they probably you know have things that they have to unlearn and rehash for themselves as well definitely thank you uh thank you for that carter um i think that that's definitely it sounds a lot a lot like um trying to educate the parents as well as uh, tr really trying to change the hearts and the minds as well. And even maybe sending them, them some resources, maybe they need to rehash some of their trauma as well. Um, I, I wanted to also invite uh, uh, Dr. Jones or Dr. Kingry, if you all wanted to add anything uh, to ways that providers might um, be able to, what they can do for youth that they suspect might be in a anti-LGBTQ environment. Um, and then um, if not, I have a my final question for you all. Now, the, what, what I see um, when we are suspecting that or just actually know it, that's what they're going to, that is a time that even though that we are busy, that's the time that we have to take the time and speak to the youth then speak to the family and then see what can you can broker for you, between the two. Uh, so that may be helpful, but also make sure like um, Carter said, the resources are available there for the parent as well as the child, uh, because it's so important. They got to have a way to have an escape. Um, having someone supportive within the family, and, and it may be a cousin, it may be a, a friend or somebody else that they can turn to when things get even more tough than what what we can imagine it can be, but having that escape route uh, for the talking or just a place to go. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is, we know that um, our LGBTQ youth are at very high risk of um, suicide, um, self-harm, um, and um, 
So, you know, certainly being in an unsupportive, unaffirming environment um, makes that risk skyrocket. Um, and, you know, we know that having zero unsupportive uh, family members increases the risk of suicide in a transgender um, adolescent very significantly. And having just one supportive parent decreases that risk by nearly 50%. And so, um, you know, I, um, and I'm sure Dr. Folsom and Dr. Jones spend some time in rooms and we see a, a unsupportive environment um, educating um, about um, the need for support, um, look, um, talk, discussing the risks, um, and trying to find um, places, safe places for um, our youth to go to where they feel comfortable, where they feel um, affirmed. Um, if we do see that, we are lucky enough to have a social worker in our um, clinic who can help us and assist us when we um, when we see this and encounter this. Um, I, you know, I wish I never encountered it at all. Um, and I, I wish I could tell you that. Unfortunately, it happens far more often um, than I want to even um, think or admit. Um, but it does take a lot of education. And I will say that, you know, what um, what the providers say to, um, to guardians, to parents, to families, it really matters. Um, and I can tell you a number of stories that I've heard from parents um, who have brought this up to a provider at some point um, in uh, the child's um, health career, whether it was young, three or four or five, um, 11 or 12, where the provider was very dismissive um, of it. And, um, and the parents took that as that's the way it was and never brought it up again. And um, and, you know, the, the harm that was done because of that. And so, you know, I think as providers, we have an obligation to educate. Um, and, um, you know, if this is something that you're unsure about or don't, don't know, then certainly, you know, the, the thing to do is not give misinformation. Um, it's to get, provide the correct information. And so I just really want to stress that, that what we say really has an impact and really does matter. Words matter. I can't say that enough. Um, our language we use matters. Um, and so we just need to be really careful um, about how we use that. Thank, thank you all so much. I definitely wanted to get all of your all's perspective, especially on that question right there, because it it, is, it literally is a life uh, life or death situation. And um, the word and the language really does matter. And I think that everybody uh, in the healthcare field, uh, in the mental health, uh, you know, from social work, psychology, everybody um, it, it needs to know how important that is, um, especially when you're working with um, LGBTQ plus youth. Um, my last question uh, for uh, you, Dr. Kinger and Dr. Jones, um, is how do you all necessarily provide, how, do a, how, how, would, how can a provider navigate a potential healthcare disagreement between the youth and the guardian. So the parent of the guardian believes, you know, one thing and the youth is like, I'd rather have it this way. Um, how do you all reconcile that disagreement? Suzanne, I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> really challenging. Um, you know, unfortunately, when you're dealing with um, a minor and a minor in the United States is anyone that's under the age of 18. So, um, you know, you have to have parental consent to um, for any sort of medication, hormone, um, healthcare intervention um, from from a medication perspective. And so, um, and unfortunately, you have to if both. Um, guardians have medical decision making, um, then it requires both um, guardians to consent um, to therapy. And so, you know, if one guardian is in agreement and one is adamantly opposed, it, it's a really challenging uh, legal uh, situation um, when it is in the best interest of your patient to, to move forward with, with intervention um, and gender affirming therapy of, of, of some kind. And so, um, unfortunately, um, you know, we have to get lawyers involved, um, the court system is involved um, in those situations when it is in the best interest, you know, um, we try to avoid that at all costs. Sometimes it's an education thing. Um, sometimes it's a fear. Um, there's a lot of fear out there um, about um, sort of the unknown or that we're gonna do something and then it's gonna be irreversible and then we've caused harm. And so really it's talking through what, um, what that concern is and addressing that concern because, because sometimes it doesn't require going um, to such um, drastic steps. Um, but unfortunately, if it is in the best interest of, um, of our patient, um, and then that's what we have to do. 
I uh, totally agree with that. I uh, totally agree. It's, it's listening to the stories. Let, let us hear the stories from our youth, but then also hear what those fears are uh, from the parents. And then hopefully we can come together with some type of compromise that can work us to the point where, we, where, we, where the youth would like for it to be. But it takes time. And sometimes it takes a lot of time and rarely do we have to get uh, legal involved, uh, but we always have to think about what's best for this, for the youth. And that, that's where our concern is. But letting people express their stories can make a big difference. Um, I would mention something just really quick on the mental health side of things with minors and like when there is like a disagreement in healthcare and things like that. So as I know in Kentucky, um, it's going to vary by state, but in Kentucky, um, people aged um, 16 and older can consent to mental health treatment on their own. So if you do have parents um, who are unsupportive or unaffirming and the youth is age 16, to 18, they can consent to their own mental health treatment if um, a provider is talking with them about potentially seeking that out. So, you know, and with that, with the, if there's a problem as far as trans transportation, anything like that, use the school system. I mean, in a very um, confidential way, use the school system to see how they can be very supportive as well with the counseling there. Thank you. I, I think that that's a really good uh, point as well. Just uh, it it takes a, it takes a village to support our youth. Uh, you know, to, and so I think that it's not even just the healthcare field; it's also the education field. It's everybody. So I mean, we all just need to kind of really shelter, like, and support our youth to uplift them, especially if in the case in which their parent or guardian, um, I, I won't say wall, but might, might just not know how to do it the, the best way right now. Um, so thank you, uh, panelists. Uh, like this, that's all the moderated questions I, have, questions I have for you all. I have some audience questions right now, but I just want to thank you all so much for all of that insight um, that you all gave us just now. Um, so I'm, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and get started into the questions that are here right now. Um, this kind of touches on the last thing, uh, topics I'll uh, ask you all here. Um, do you, uh, somewhat, somebody has submitted, do you all ever deal with Legality issues. Oh, hold on a second. The thing went down. Okay. Do you ever uh, deal with legality issues around certain treatments? Um, so I know you all said yes, but I, if you might want to expand on that a little bit more. Um, they had an example where it, this happened in another country, but they said, for instance, uh, their brother wanted to start testosterone, but he was under 15. So they needed both parents to consent and their father didn't. And it started a legal ba battle where a sexologist had to help and testify. Um, did you all... Um, of course, he said yes on the legal issues, but is there anything else that you would want to add to that, to speak to that? Oh, you know, I think sometimes uh, what you're saying about the mental health treatment, there, there are some families that think that's the big no-no. So it's nice to know that at 16 that, that someone can do that for themselves. But because um, that may be a big Issue. It usually doesn't come to the legal side, but that's good to know that at 16, they don't need to have that permission. Thank you. Thank you, Faye. Um, I didn't know that, actually, but thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now, this next question is uh, more directed at Dr. Kingree, but um, it's open to uh, anyone uh, that might want to uh, chip in on or pitch in on that. Uh, but um, what kind of outreach do you do? Um, what kind of outreach do you all do to make your services known to children and adolescents that would benefit from your services. So how, how do you make your services known? Well, I wish we could have a billboard on 65 because that would be the best way. So if anyone can knows how to make that happen for me, then let's connect after this webinar because I would love it. Um, it's, it's really challenging because, um, you know, kind of getting the word out there. And so how best do you do that? And so, you know, we have gone, gone the provider route first sort of in the network of, um, you know, uh, if you have, we have a, a provider who has a patient or who um, has a family that, that brings a patient that might um, benefit us to know that we exist. Um, and so we've done a lot of outreach from that perspective. Um, we've also recently done some Facebook um, 
um, things about our program to sort of get that word out there. We've tried to find um, terms that um, people might Google. Um, and so how, you know, if you're Googling these terms, then how do we connect our services so that they can find us on the internet? So, um, so we've done some of that route um, to, try to, to try to use those terminologies. Interestingly, um, people Google puberty a lot. And so um, we have um, tied, tried to tie in this um, puberty with, um, with those terms to sort of make us known. But, you know, social media is really kind of where things are right now. And so, um, and word of mouth is big. And so, you know, we try to, you know, utilize um, our resources as best we can, try to utilize social media um, as best that we can um, and, um, you know, letting us know, but, but it's, it's really hard. Um, and so that's why, you know, we really depend on our, our local resources, our local groups. Um, you know, we want to make, make it known, but, um, but I don't know. Billboard is my best idea. Yes. So if anybody knows somebody that can get an investor that will help us get a billboard out there, like definitely we need billboards everywhere. So everybody knows about the PAGE program at Norton Children's Endocrinology. So yes, I, I agree. Um, uh, so, uh, another topic that kind of came up in the panel discussion was around this idea of um, uh, we need privacy for youth, but uh, kind of like addressing like issues of like sexuality um, and with uh, uh, pay, pedi pediatric patients. And we actually have two questions around this topic. Um, so the first one is kind of, uh, they said that at the university, at, at UofL School of Medicine, um, they're always taught to ask pronouns and sexual orientation. But at what age do we start asking children about sexual activities? And uh, do you ask the, the guardians to leave the room? Um, that could either, I guess, be before or after you ask this question, or and also, do we put it in the EHRs, which can be requested by the guardian? So I'll kind of break it down. So, at what age do we ask children about these sexual activities? Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends starting on age eleven. So um, that's the current recommendation um, to start asking um, about that. Um, certainly making it a very age appropriate is important. Um, so you can't ask the same kinds of questions to an 11 year old that you would ask a 17 year old. So, um, you know, uh, so making sure that it's age appropriate um, is, is what kind of needs to happen. But, um, but certainly asking the parents to leave the room and starting that process, um, you would don't want to ask those questions with um, any um, guardian or parents um, in the room. You need to start establishing, um, establishing at that time. Um, and letting it certainly, and just going back to what, you know, Colton said, you know, is you have to um, establish sort of what is private and what is not private um, so that they understand um, what they share with you can be private. Um, I don't know, Dr. Jones, about um, EHR. I know they hold certain things from parents um, in terms of STD testing and things of that nature. I, I don't know about sexual orientation and gender so identity. With, with the adolescent, a lot of that stuff is, uh, is private for the adolescent only. Uh, and, you know, as far as the age, uh, yeah, the recommendations at 11, but sometimes behaviors and other things may cause you to ask those questions sooner. Yeah, okay. Uh, th thank you both uh, for answering uh, that. I was, I was adding in here to the chat as well. I uh, put it the website for the uh, Pediatrics and Adolescent uh, Gender Education Clinic, the PAGE Clinic, uh, right there for Norton's. Um, but yes, it's just, uh, depending on the age of uh, Faye that you said, it depends on the age um, of the child and what it might, the call for for having these conversations. How do you necessarily, and this is the next question that an audience member had, how can we ensure that kids um, understand that their uh, gender and sexuality is something that, might, that they might want to bring up in a brief moment of a one-on-one -on -one conversation, especially when young people may feel uncomfortable discussing sexuality of any kind? Um, and they, what they were saying is, are there any effective ways that can be discreetly sex positive without upsetting parents who might may be offended by bringing up the issues or a kid that might not feel comfortable discussing it, discussing it? You know, that is one of the reasons why you start bringing up these topics really, really early so that you can be, you're building that trust along the way. So it's not all of a sudden at 11 years old, I'm bringing up these questions or talking about these topics. You're talking about it as as you, uh, this child is growing. So it is not um, 
something new. It is not something scary. It is something that's part of, of when they come in, we're going to be talking about the importance of these these topics and how how you're feeling about it, all of these things. So you start it early, bring that um, trust with that patient and with the guardians. Um, there's also um, having like some really little like symbolic things really help youth to know that you are a safe and supportive person. So if you wear like a white coat or um, have a name badge, having um, like a, a pride pin or sticker, having like a pronoun pin or sticker like Dr. Kinger, yes. No. Having um, like magazines in your waiting room that are gender diverse, are sexual orientation diverse. Do they show same sex couples or are they only showing straight couples? Um, or even like having um, you know, different types of um, like sexual health posters and things that encompass the broad range of people's gender and sexual identities yeah. are really helpful and can show kids like, hey, well, yeah, I can talk to this person about this, so they're going to get it, some of it. So, you know, even besides the waiting room, it should be in the exam rooms as well. Yeah, I was, I was just going to add on and, and really kind of uh, say what Colton did around um, just realizing that it can be very subtle things, um, like you said, stickers, um, rainbow flags, um, the magazines in the waiting room, but also within the room. Um, and then, Aaron, something that you touched on, and both uh, Dr. Kingery um, as well, and Faye Jones, um, just language. Language is really big, and I think that... Um, and I touched on this earlier, of even asking the youth to, so, to self-identify, whether it be their gender, their sexual orientation, or even their body parts, how they see themselves, what is um, an uncomfortable space, um, what is, you know, my private space, and, and those sort of things, but also giving them, um, feeling comfortable to give them clinical um, terminology, and, and in that way as well, because I feel like a lot of times um, there can be easel, like there's, it, there's an opportunity for confusion um, when you're not using the same language or you're not on the same page or not, you know, so even sort of covering that ground, figuring out where the youth is in sort of that development for themselves uh, and meeting them where they're at. And obviously making it age appropriate, but um, youth, youth are much more connected and know much more than I think that they let on or even told their parents. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, be vulnerable, talk to them about it, see what they know, because youth are very intuitive, uh, very inquisitive, and they will, you know, go and look up these things on their own. And so that can really be a space for them to be vulnerable. But it helps when, you know, you're upfront about the language, sort of um, being real with them, um, and just giving them that space. So yeah. So and one other thing that we do in our offices, and, and a lot of pediatricians do, we have uh, age and culturally appropriate books make sure they are very diverse uh, with pictures, with families, with everything and inside those books that you're giving to these to the families. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Faye. Thank you, Carter. Thank you, uh, all my panelists. So thank you, Dr. Kingery. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Colton. Thank you, Carter, so much uh, for being here. I know you can't hear the round of applause, but I'm sure everybody's applauding to you from home for being on this panel. Um, everybody I'll also just be sure you register for the uh, patient simulation session on March 18th or participate in our vir new virtual patient simulations that are new for this year. As well as if you have any questions, um, just feel free to email me. And if you have any questions for the panelists, uh, you can email me and I'll, I'm sure I can uh, reach out to the panelists and try to get those uh, answered for you all as well. But thank you so much for attending our session today and I hope you all enjoyed it.